New Atlantis, Wikipedia article audio. New Atlantis is an incomplete utopian novel by Sir Francis Bacon, published in 1627. In this work, Bacon portrayed a vision of the future of human discovery and knowledge, expressing his aspirations and ideals for humankind. The novel depicts the creation of a utopian land where generosity and enlightenment, dignity and splendor, piety and public spirit are the commonly held qualities of the inhabitants of the mythical Ben Salem. The plan and organization of his ideal college, Salomon's House, envisioned the modern research university in both applied and pure sciences. Plot Summary The name Ben Salem Interpretations Ben Salem's Conversion to Christianity Who Rules Ben Salem? Social Ritual of the Ben Salemites Prayers Influences the novel depicts a mythical island, Ben Salem, which is discovered by the crew of a European ship after they are lost in the Pacific Ocean somewhere west of Peru. The minimal plot serves the gradual unfolding of the island, its customs, but most importantly, its state-sponsored scientific institution, Salomon's House, which house or college, is the very eye of this kingdom. Many aspects of the society and history of the island are described, such as the Christian religion which is reported to have been born there as a copy of the Bible and a letter from the Apostle St. Bartholomew arrived there miraculously, a few years after the ascension of Jesus, a cultural feast in honor of the family institution, called the Feast of the Family, a college of sages, the Salomon's House, the very eye of the kingdom, to which order God of heaven and earth had vouchsafed. The grace to know the works of creation, and the secrets of them, as well as to discern between divine miracles, works of nature, works of art and impostures and illusions of all sorts, and a series of instruments, process and methods of scientific research that were employed in the island by the Salomon's house. The interlocutors include the governor of the House of Strangers, Jobin the Jew, and the head of Salomon's house. The inhabitants of Ben Salem are described as having a high moral character and honesty, no official accepting any payment from individuals, and the people being described as chaste and pious, as said by an inhabitant of the island. But hear me now, and I will tell you what I know. You shall understand that there is not under the heavens so chaste a nation as this of Ben Salem, nor so free from all pollution or foulness. It is the virgin of the world. I remember I have read in one of your European books, of an holy hermit amongst you that desired to see the spirit of fornication, and there appeared to him a little foul ugly Ethiop. But if he had desired to see the spirit of chastity of Ben Salem, it would have appeared to him in the likeness of a fair beautiful cherubim. For there is nothing amongst mortal men more fair and admirable, than the chaste minds of this people. Know therefore, that with them there are no stews, no dissolute houses, no courtesans, nor anything of that kind. In the last third of the book, the head of the Salomon's house takes one of the European visitors to show him all the scientific background of Salomon's house, where experiments are conducted in Baconian method to understand and conquer nature, and to apply the collected knowledge to the betterment of society. Namely, one the end of their foundation, two the preparations they have for their works, three the several employments and functions whereto their fellows are assigned for and the ordinances and rites which they observe. He portrayed a vision of the future of human discovery and knowledge. The plan and organization of his ideal college, Salomon's House, envisioned the modern research university in both applied and pure science. 
The end of their foundation is thus described, the end of our foundation is the knowledge of causes, and secret motions of things, and the enlarging of the bounds of human empire, to the effecting of all things possible. In the describing the several employments and functions to which the members of the Salomon's house are assigned, the head of the college said. For the several employments and offices of our fellows, we have twelve that sail into foreign countries under the names of other nations, who bring us the books and abstracts, and patterns of experiments of all other parts. These we call merchants of light. We have three that collect the experiments which are in all books. These we call depredators. We have three that collect the experiments of all mechanical arts, and also of liberal sciences, and also of practices which are not brought into arts. These we call mystery men. We have three that try new experiments, such as themselves think good. These we call pioneers or miners. We have three that draw the experiments of the former four into titles and tables, to give the better light for the drawing of observations and axioms out of them. These we call compilers. We have three that bend themselves, looking into the experiments of their fellows, and cast about how to draw out of them things of use and practice for man's life and knowledge as well for works as for plain demonstration of causes, means of natural divinations, and the easy and clear discovery of the virtues and parts of bodies. These we call dowry men or benefactors. Then after diverse meetings and consults of our whole number, to consider of the former labors and collections, we have three that take care out of them to direct new experiments, of a higher light, more penetrating into nature than the former. These we call lamps. We have three others that do execute the experiments so directed, and report them. These we call inoculators. Lastly, we have three that raise the former discoveries by experiments into greater observations, axioms, and aphorisms. These we call interpreters of nature. Even this short excerpt demonstrates that Bacon understood that science requires analysis and not just the accumulation of observations. Bacon also foresaw that the design of experiments could be improved. In describing the ordinances and rites observed by the scientists of Salomon's house, its head said, We have certain hymns and services, which we say daily, of Lord and thanks to God for his marvelous works, and some forms of prayer, imploring his aid and blessing for the illumination of our labors, and the turning of them into good and holy uses. And finally, after showing all the scientific background of Salomon's house, he gave the European visitor permission to publish it. And when he had said this, he stood up, and I, as I had been taught, kneeled down, and he laid his right hand upon my head, and said, God bless thee, my son, and God bless this relation, which I have made. I give thee leave to publish it for the good of other nations, for we here are in God's bosom, a land unknown. Ben Salem is composed of two Hebrew words, Ben, son, and Salem or Shalem, whole or complete. Thus the name could be interpreted as meaning the son of wholeness. New Atlantis is a story dense with provocative details. There are many credible interpretations of what Bacon was attempting to convey. Below are a couple that give some sense of the rich implications of the text. Early in the story, the governor of the House of Strangers relates the incredible circumstances that introduced Christianity to the island. About twenty years after the ascension of our Saviour it came to pass, that there was seen by the people of Ronfusa, as it might be some mile in the sea, a great pillar of light, 
not sharp, but in form of a column, or cylinder, rising from the sea, a great way up toward heaven, and on the top of it was seen a large cross of light, more bright and resplendent than the body of the pillar. Upon which so strange a spectacle, the people of the city gathered apace together upon the sands, to wonder, and so after put themselves into a number of small boats to go nearer to this marvellous sight. But when the boats were come within about sixty yards of the pillar, they found themselves all bound, and could go no further, yet so as they might move to go about, but might not approach nearer so as the boats stood all as in a theatre, beholding this light, as a heavenly sign. It so fell out that there was in one of the boats one of the wise men of the society of Salomon's house, who having a while attentively and devoutly viewed and contemplated this pillar and cross, fell down upon his face, and then raised himself upon his knees, and lifting up his hands to heaven, made his prayers in this manner. Lord God of heaven and earth, Thou hast vouchsafed of Thy grace, to those of our order to know Thy works of creation, and true secrets of them, and to discern, as far as appertaineth to the generations of men, between divine miracles, works of nature, works of art and impostures, and illusions of all sorts. I do here acknowledge and testify before this people that the thing we now see before our eyes is thy finger, and a true miracle. And forasmuch as we learn in our books that thou never workest miracles, but to a divine and excellent end, we most humbly beseech thee to prosper this great sign, and to give us the interpretation and use of it in mercy, which thou dost in some part secretly promise, by sending it unto us. When he had made his prayer he presently found the boat he was in movable and unbound, whereas all the rest remained still fast, and taking that for an assurance of leave to approach, he caused the boat to be softly and with silence rowed toward the pillar, but ere he came near it, the pillar and cross of light broke up, and cast itself abroad, as it were, into a firmament of many stars, which also vanished soon after and there was nothing left to be seen but a small ark or chest of cedar, dry, and not wet at all with water, though it swam, and in the fore end of it, which was toward him, grew a small green branch of palm, and when the wise man had taken it with all reverence into his boat, it opened of itself, and there were found in it a book and a letter, both written in fine parchment, and wrapped in cindens of linen. The book contained all the canonical books of the Old and New Testament, according as you have them, and the Apocalypse itself, and some other books of the New Testament, which were not at that time written, were nevertheless in the book. And for the letter, it was in these words. I, Bartholomew, a servant of the Highest, an Apostle of Jesus Christ, was warned by an angel that appeared to me in a vision of glory, that I should commit this ark to the floods of the sea. Therefore I do testify and declare unto that people where God shall ordain this ark to come to land, that in the same day is come unto them salvation and peace, and good will from the Father, and from the Lord Jesus. There was also in both these writings, as well the book as the letter, wrought a great miracle, conformed to that of the apostles, in the original gift of tongues. For there being at that time, in this land, Hebrews, Persians, and Indians, besides the natives, every one read upon the book and letter, as if they had been written in his own language. And thus was this land saved from infidelity by an ark, through the apostolical and miraculous evangelism of St. Bartholomew. And here he paused, and a messenger came and called him forth from us. So this was all that passed in that conference. The traditional date for the writing of St. John's Apocalypse is the end of the first century AD.
it is not only the presence of the full canon of scripture long before it was completed or compiled, but also the all too convenient proximity of the scientist who will attest to its miraculous nature of this wonder that lends the story an air of increased edibility. Later the father of Salomon's house reveals the institution's skill at creating illusions of light. We represent also all multiplications of light, which we carry to great distance, and make so sharp as to discern small points and lines. Also all colorations of light, all delusions and deceits of the sight, in figures, magnitudes, motions, colors, all demonstrations of shadows. We find also divers means, yet unknown to you, of producing of light, originally from divers bodies. He also boasts about their ability to fake miracles. And surely you will easily believe that we, that have so many things truly natural which induce admiration, could in a world of particulars deceive the senses if we would disguise those things, and labor to make them more miraculous. Renneker points out the Latin of the second passage is stronger and literally translates to we could impose on men's senses an infinite number of things if we wanted to present these things as, and exalt them into, a miracle. The skill of creating illusions coupled with the increased edibility of the story of the origin of Ben Salem's Christianity makes it seem that Bacon was intimating that the light show was an invention of Salomon's house. The presence of Hebrews, Persians, and Indians in Ben Salem at the time implies that Asian people were already in the first century engaged in sailing across the Pacific, which is historically inaccurate but might have seemed plausible at the time of writing. The father of Salomon's house reveals that members of that institution decide on their own which of their discoveries to keep secret, even from the state. And this we do also, we have consultations, which of the inventions and experiences which we have discovered shall be published, and which not and take all an oath of secrecy for the concealing of those which we think fit to keep secret, though some of those we do reveal some time to the state, and some not. This would seem to imply that the state does not hold the monopoly on authority and that Salomon's house must in some sense be superior to the state. In the introduction to the critical edition of New Atlantis, Jerry Weinberger notes that Jobin is the only contemporary character described as wise and wise in matters of government and rule at that. Weinberger speculates that Jobin may be the actual ruler of Ben Salem. On the other hand, prejudice against Jews was widespread in his time, so the possibility cannot be excluded that Bacon was calling Jobin wise for the same reason that he felt the need elsewhere to call him the good Jew to make clear that Jobin's character was benign. While Bacon appears concerned with the House of Salomon, a portion of the narrative describes the social practices of the Bensali myths, particularly those surrounding courtship and family life. An example of these rituals is the Adam and Eve pools. Here betrothed send surrogates to observe the other bathing to discover any deformities. Here Bacon alludes to Sir Thomas More's Utopia, where More describes a similar ritual. However, the crucial difference is rather than surrogates, the young couple observes the other naked. Bacon's character Jobin remarks on this difference, I have read in a book of one of your men, of a feigned commonwealth, where the married couple are permitted, before they contract, to see one another naked. In describing how the scientists of New Atlantis worked, Bacon wrote, We have certain hymns and services, which we say daily, of Lord and thanks to God for his marvelous works, and some forms of prayer, imploring his aid and blessing for the illumination of our labors, and the turning of them into good and holy uses. In Bacon's theological tracts, there are two prayers, 
named the student's prayer and the writer's prayer which may be a demonstration of how scientists could pray as described in the New Atlantis. New Atlantis and other writings of Bacon inspired the formation of the Royal Society. Jonathan Swift parroted them both in Book 3 of Gulliver's Travels. In recent years, New Atlantis influenced B.F. Skinner's 1948 Walden II. This novel may have been Bacon's vision for a utopian new world in North America. In it he depicted a land where there would be freedom of religion showing a Jew treated fairly and equally in an island of Christians. It has been argued that this work had influenced others' reforms, such as greater rights for women, the abolition of slavery elimination of debtors' prisons, separation of church and state, and freedom of political expression, although there is no hint of these reforms in the New Atlantis itself. His propositions of legal reform, though, are considered to have been one of the influences behind the Napoleonic Code, and therefore could show some resemblance with or influence in the drafting of other liberal constitutions that came in the centuries after Bacon's lifetime, such as the American Constitution. Francis Bacon played a leading role in creating the English colonies, especially in Virginia, the Carolinas, and Newfoundland in northeastern Canada. His government report on the Virginia colony was submitted in 1609. In 1610 Bacon and his associates received a charter from the king to form the Tracerer and the Company of Adventurers and Planter of the City of London and Bristol for the colony or plan taken in Newfoundland and sent John Guy to found a colony there. In 1910 Newfoundland issued a postage stamp to commemorate Bacon's role in establishing the province. The stamp describes Bacon as the guiding spirit in colonization scheme of 1610. Moreover, some scholars believe he was largely responsible for the drafting, in 1609 and 1612 of two charters of government for the Virginia colony. Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States and author of the Declaration of Independence, wrote, Bacon, Locke, and Newton. I consider them as the three greatest men that have ever lived, without any exception, and as having laid the foundation of those superstructures which have been raised in the physical and moral sciences. Historian and biographer William Hepworth Dixon considered that Bacon's name could be included in the list of founders of the United States of America. It is also believed by the Rosicrucian organization Amork that Bacon would have influenced a settlement of mystics in North America, stating that the New Atlantis inspired a colony of Rosicrucians led by Johannes Kelpius to journey across the Atlantic Ocean in a chartered vessel called Sarah Maria, and move on to Pennsylvania in the late 17th century. According to their claims, these Rosicrucian communities made valuable contributions to the newly emerging American culture in the fields of printing, philosophy, the sciences, and arts. The utopian writer Krillis Balotis adopted the name Atlanticus when he wrote Der Zukunft State in 1898.